Namaste. So we're continuing with the Lalita Sahasranama. This whole section of names, about the next 12 or 14 names, deals with Kundalini. A Kundalini is the most subtle manifestation of the goddess. It is her manifestation as the life energy, the life principle. Not just prana, but also intelligence and even consciousness. So anything that we can say that we are, the body, the mind, even the life energy and consciousness, is actually her. And to realize this is the kundalini arising. And typically it goes through several stages based on the chakras. Now, I've already described this in an earlier video. Uh, in fact, uh, a, a couple of earlier videos. So I won't go into too much detail here, but I want to concentrate mainly on the grantis. The grantis are the knots, K-N-O-T's, <laughs> in the uh, spinal column, the blockages that stop her from arising when we cling to them as ego identifications. So we'll get to those in good time and then we'll describe them. So first we want to start with Nama 98. Samayachara Tatpara. The Samaya is the mental form of worship that leads to Kundalini rising. Now, this is very confidential. Huh? It's not given out to unqualified people, period. So if you want to learn it, and I was taught this back in 1978 in Kashmir, you have to have certain initiations first. They just won't even talk to you about it if you don't. I was invited, actually, uh, to attend this tantric school. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> it's very deep and very complex. And it requires initiation from a guru. You cannot do it yourself. So I'm going to gloss over most of the details of the Samaya. Samaya is the path of internal Tantra, Kundalini Yoga, the real Kundalini Yoga, not the phony, nonsense, westernized, commercialized, watered down, superficial garbage that's advertised on the internet. Okay, this is not on the internet, not anywhere on the internet. I've looked and I cannot find the Samaya path. There are hints of it in various scriptures. But they're, again, encoded, they're, they're hints, they're not explanations. To get the real explanation, you have to approach a guru and get the proper initiations. You can't skimp on this. So Samaya is the path, and Achara means one who lives or dwells in the path or even as the path. And tatpara means that she is the object or the deity or the goal of that path, the highest aspiration of that path. So there's a long article in the commentary, which I've reproduced in my book pretty completely, uh, that talks about this process and how it's done. And Basically, it says the same thing that I just did, but uses a lot more words. <laughs> that you have to approach a guru, you have to be initiated into the secrets. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're pretending. You don't really know. You don't really have a link with the tradition going back to the mother herself. 
and you won't get the results. What you will get is a lot of trouble. And there are many books and many internet sites and many posts on different forums about people who got into trouble doing Kundalini Yoga and then they're asking for what is the solution? But if you give them the real solution, they won't accept it. Oh, I can't go to a guru. You know, I'm not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> now, as far as I'm concerned, Kundalini arose spontaneously in me back in 1984. 1984, I had just been on uh, the Rancho Rajneesh uh, in Oregon. I stayed there. I lived there for about six months. And I really, I didn't do anything. <laughs> You know, everybody was working like madmen, 18 hours a day. But he didn't give me anything to do. So I just did nothing. I had a, a big building out in the middle of the desert. I was there all by myself. No supervision. I just went in for meals and meditations and came back and walked around in the desert and meditated a lot. And... Sooner or later, of course, the management figured out that I was, wasn't doing anything, quote unquote, and they kicked me out. Uh, this is the same teacher who, who said, don't just do something, sit there. But anyway, I had my disagreements with the management and I left and I went to my apartment in Portland and just sat. I did nothing, I had nothing to do. So I just sat and I was the witness. And after about six weeks of this, 12 to 18 hours a day, Kundalini spontaneously arose. I watched the whole process happen. And of course, at the time, I didn't know any of this. So it was just, wow, what is all this cool stuff happening internally? And then later on, when I actually learned about it, I was like, wow, that was a full-on kundalini rising. And of course, then, as I've told several times, she appeared in my living room, basically, and tapped me here. That's why I wear my bindu here instead of here. She tapped me right here. And I had a fantastic vision of Brahman in everything and everything in Brahman. So, I mean, that's the same experience basically that Osho had, as he describes in his, some of his books. And the difference between me and Osho is that I didn't make it into a business. <laughs> so anyway, I was protected. I have positions in my birth chart, planetary positions, that block all of that. I couldn't do it even if I wanted to. But actually, I'm not at all inclined to that kind of activity. So I just kept to myself and enjoyed my own consciousness. And gradually, as I learned more and more about the path, I realized that all this had happened to me spontaneously. And the reason it happened to me, without any hardly any effort, I mean, just sitting around, you know, what kind of effort is that? <laughs> the reason it happened to me like that is that previously to that, I had spent 20 years, more than 20 years, like 25 years doing bhakti yoga. I was a devotee of Krishna studying with Bhakti Vedanta Swami and doing lots and lots of ceremonies. Lots and lots of puja, lots and lots of mantra to the divine goddess in her form as Radharani. So I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> she accepted this. She accepted it and then she responded by later on arranging things so that I would have the time to meditate, quiet the mind, and she could reveal herself, which she did. So in other words, 
all this fancy internal visualizations and, and uh, mental pujas and complicated mantras and all of this stuff isn't really necessary <laughs> if you follow the path of the four darshana, chatur darshanams, the four views that we have been presenting on here for years. And uh, so far, I mean, nobody has really learned it. I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand why. Here I'm giving like the highest level knowledge and people are just like ignoring it and going after, they're going after trinkets when they could have, you know, the chest of gold, right? Very strange. But anyway, it's because I followed this path, not deliberately, not accidentally either, I was guided, I was set up. <laughs> my whole childhood, my whole karma, my whole birth chart, everything is uh, a total setup for this kind of life where I would avoid any major entanglements in my life. I would avoid uh, any huge commitments, even though I got married twice and I had two children. I could not keep those relationships together. They just disintegrated. There was nothing I could do about it. And I kept being thrown back on aloneness. Every time I tried to interact with some organization, it was a disaster. Huh? Finally, I learned, you know, <laughs> that to just rely on myself and do what I need to do to take care of myself and not depend on anybody and not get involved with any organization and just concentrate on my sadhana within. And this has given me the highest bliss. What can I say, people? See, everybody is conditioned by school to think that I can't know anything. Only, you know, really important genius people you know, usually old white men <laughs> can know anything or discover anything or do anything worthwhile or important. So I have to follow them. I can't think, think or come up with anything for myself. Huh? I can't know anything independently. I always have to depend on somebody, some authority to tell me. And the other thing they, they drive into us, huh? with a sledgehammer, is that we have to be a part of a group. Huh? What is a class? Why, the whole time we're in school, we're in a class, a group. And you see, this is operant conditioning. This is behavioral conditioning. Like, you know, what's his name and, his, and the dogs, Pavlov and his dogs. He rings a bell every time he feeds the dog, and then later on he rings the bell by itself, and the dogs start to salivate. <laughs> so it's the same. They ring a bell, and you go to your class, right? And then they ring a bell, and you go to your next class. It's exactly the same kind of conditioning. Duh. So until you fight against and break that conditioning, you will require some external structure, even for the most important task of realizing your inner self. Does anybody besides me think that that's nuts? Huh? That we live in a society where we're so conditioned that it takes years of training to overcome it? You know, I think that's nuts. But anyway, that's the world we live in. And so I'm going to continue to present these names. <laughs> I, I'm going to put part of the explanation in the video uh, description uh, from the commentary about this. But remember, you don't really need any of it. You pick one mantra, one beautiful name of the goddess, and you just focus on that. If you can get initiated into that mantra, huh? we have a series on Mahashodashi mantra. 
and you can get initiated into it and you can chant that mantra and that will give you all the benefits that are described in all these different scriptures very, very easily. The only price is total devotion. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.